Weber has got to be one of the funnest characters in the game. On the surface, he might seem like he's just Wilson, except he won't get attacked by spiders. However, he's so much more than that. If you play him right, instead of being Wilson with slightly different stats, Weber becomes a war machine that outdamages even Wolfgang, deals with hordes way better than Wendy, and tanks damage better than Wigfrid. I did a poll on my channel a while back asking which character is the best at fighting frog rain. Wendy won it by a landslide, but in reality the correct answer is Weber, and it's not even close. Every character on the list has to expend some kind of resource in order to deal with the frogs. However, if you have the right army, Weber can crush frog rain without losing a single spider. This is what makes Weber so fun to play as. Once you've got the right army, almost every threat Weber faces in the game becomes a joke. Even the strongest characters still have to expend resources in order to take down enemies. But when it comes to Weber, all he needs to do is fake one attack with the boomerang and watch as his target gets obliterated. Now Weber can do that to almost every enemy in the game. However, when it comes to raid bosses, it's a completely different story. Raid bosses are a step up from the regular seasonal bosses, and in my opinion are supposed to be the toughest challenges that the game has to offer. Each raid boss has an ability to counter Weber's spider army. Usually this comes in the form of a massively strong AoE attack, but sometimes their counter to Weber is panicking all his spiders with their scream. If you simply sick your army on these guys, your spiders are going to get annihilated. However, with the right tactics, Weber can work around these moves, which lets him steamroll even the strongest enemies in the game. So if you want to see that, stick around as I recap my all raid boss rush I did as Weber. Before we get into the run, I wanted to go over the game plan. This channel has put out several videos on Weber, and one of them went over the unique abilities of all the spiders Weber has at his disposal. So if you want to know more, the link is in the description. If you want to know the basics of Weber, Beard covers it and Pogser covers it in a short. For the most part, I'll be using my ideal army which consists of about 50 spiders, 15% of which are nurses, 15% are danglers, and the rest spitters. However, if I'm short on spitters, danglers will make decent replacements. When attacking something, the nurse will use its AoE heal every 10 seconds. The ability heals everything in it for 150 HP, so the nurses make the army practically unkillable against everything except bosses. In addition to the nurses making the army invincible, they also heal Weber for 8 HP with every jump. So if Weber is ever low on health, all he needs to do is have the spiders fight something, and he'll be back to full in no time. Spitters have the highest DPS out of all the spiders, and can attack at range making them the best spider for offense. And Dangling Death Dwellers have a lot of health, and help to separate spitters from the enemies, so they play a vital role in both offense and defense. Despite this army being extremely strong, there will be times in this run where I don't want them around. Since I don't want to just lose all my valuable spiders each time I need to be alone, I'll be parking them at a decorated den, right next to a single piece of walled off pigskin. Unlike Wirt, Weber has a bunch of items that give him control over his spiders. The den decorating set turns spider dens into decorated spider dens that pacify all neutral spiders within a certain area. Normally, neutral spiders would attack walls, however pacified spiders don't, and will just continue to walk to the pigskin on the outside of the wall forever. So whenever I need to put my army away, I just get them near the walls and shoebox them. The shoebox makes all friendly spiders neutral, so they won't follow me anymore, and will instead stay glued to the walls, which means I can come back and befriend them again the next time I need them. Although spitters, danglers, and nurses are my ideal army, there will be times when I'll be using other spider variants, since their unique abilities are more suited to certain situations. Finally, Weber's secret weapon is the boomerang. For every other character, the boomerang is a weak weapon that's only real use is for hunting birds and rabbits. In the hands of Weber, the boomerang is an invaluable tool which allows him to aggro his spiders onto enemies from a distance. This means Weber can just fake an attack on an enemy and watch them get obliterated instead of putting himself in danger or wasting time running right up to them to initiate a melee attack. The same can be done with ranged tools such as the ice staff, but the boomerang is better in my opinion because its ingredients are so easy to obtain. So that's pretty much the gist of it. I'll be directing my ideal army with the boomerang and putting them away or swapping to different spiders as needed. With that out of the way, let's get into the run. Like any boss rush using characters other than Wolfgang or Walter, it's really beneficial to tame a beefalo. So after spawning in, I did what I normally do and got a bunch of twigs, grass, and flint. Then I headed to the mosaic biome where I mined a bunch of gold veins. After obtaining at least 11 gold, I headed out in search of the beefalo. Luckily, the beefalo savanna was really close to spawn, so I shaved the two I could find while they slept to get their wool. Unfortunately, this was kind of a messed up world, so the two beefalo that I shaved were the only ones in the entire biome. Therefore, I bound one of the shaved beefalo with the beefalo bell and started taming it with food. For boss rushes using beefalo, juicy berries are much better than regular ones, since cooking them increases their hunger value to 18.75, and you can get a ton of them while exploring the map. So keeping my beefalo fed while I waited for its fur to grow back was pretty easy. One thing that's not so easy as Weber is getting pigskin. Usually I can just break pig houses for stuff. However, Weber is a spider, so I'll have to fight a pig after destroying a house. After getting enough pigskin for a saddle and a football helmet, I headed to the caves where I got the light bulbs I'll need for a lantern. 
After that, I was pretty much ready to set up base. I decided to base near the frog ponds since it was pretty central and the frogs would be a good quick source of meat that I can obtain without starting a spider war. After plopping down the alchemy engine, I crafted the saddle, football helmet, and the lantern. Now I'm ready to explore the map. I have a bunch of things to do before I can start getting my army, but really the primary objective while running around the surface is to find and assemble all three suspicious marble for the shadow pieces fight. While searching for the pieces, I set up walls for dragonfly, since doing this with the huge army of spiders is really annoying. Instead of digging up saplings, I chose to collect spiky bushes, since beef will block all the damage from picking these, and they will continue to grow during winter and summer. On day 9, I found the moonstone, and I again built walls around it, so I wouldn't have to do this while surrounded by a horde of spiders. After searching about 90% of the map, I finally had all the pieces assembled by day 10. With the pieces assembled, there were just two things left to do before going to the caves. The first is to obtain the nurse spider. Earlier I found the touchstone in the swamp, so I planted my spider den next to an existing one and upgraded the boat to level 3. Then after leaving my beefalo away and putting all my meat items into my piggyback, I punched both dens to get myself killed and then haunted both of them over and over until one turned into a spider queen. After this I revived myself at the touchstone and fought the queen until she finally spawned a nurse spider. After befriending the nurse, I now had the nurse switch doodle unlocked, which means I can make as many nurses as I want, given I had enough monster meat, honey, and silk. The last thing that I needed to do before going to the caves was build the spider parking lot. So after walling off a single pigskin, I planted a spider den, upgraded it to tier 2, and pacified it with the den decorating set. After finishing all of my surface objectives, I was ready for the caves. This is where the fun really begins, since I'll be assembling my army full of powerful spider variants. Once I had everything I needed, I opened up a sinkhole and headed down. Like any boss rush, the primary objective of the caves is to rush the ruins. Since I'm playing Weber, I need to go to the Spelagmite biome first. On the way there, I saw a few Spelagmites in the red mushroom forest, so I blew the webby whistle to bring the spiders out of their dens, and befriended all the spitters I could. Later, I found the Spelagmite biome, which had way more dens than the red mushroom. Ideally, I would just want the spitters. However, one meat lets Weber befriend up to three spiders, so I don't mind the extra cave spiders, since I can just murder them for free materials. This Spelagmite biome also had a bunch of dangling dead water webs, so I didn't have to wait until the labyrinth to get them. After a day of befriending spiders and turning a few into nurses, I exited the Spelagmite biome with over 20 spitters, about 9 danglers, and all the nurses I'd need. I was finally ready to take on the ruins. There are no real threats to this army in the wilds. Since I have so many nurses and all my spiders have over 300 HP, this army can pretty much take on an unlimited amount of monkeys. With the boomerang and miner's hat, whenever I want to kill something, all I do is equip both, fake an attack, and watch as the target is obliterated. Even a pack of dead worms stands no chance against the army. All of them die without taking out a single spider. The only danger to Weber is really nightmare creatures, since spiders can't help fight those. However, I can just outrun them or fight them while the spiders take out everything else. After sanitizing the wilds, I headed to the actual ruins and started killing everything in sight. Clockwork knights and especially bishops would usually give regular characters a hard time. However, they fall into the same category as depth worms and monkeys. For Weber, a single fig attack from the boomerang and these guys are dead in seconds. As strong as this army is, there is one mob that can spell trouble for them, and that's the Clockwork Rooks. The Rooks charge deals 200 damage to mobs, and hits multiple targets, so these guys can actually kill tons of spiders. I have a very strong army, so singular Rooks are usually stunlocked and killed before they can do anything. However, these guys often spawn in pairs. To combat the Rooks, I use my beefalo to shield my spiders from damage, basically body blocking the Rooks' charges before they can get to the spiders. By doing that, I am able to take on the more dangerous set pieces of the ruins without any casualties. After clearing out most of the branch, I finally found the labyrinth on day 18. You probably already know this, but the labyrinth is an incredibly useful area for Weber, since it allows him to befriend an enormous amount of dangling death dwellers. These guys are not as good as spitters, but are still great additions to the army, so I befriended a bunch of these guys while rolling any clockworks in my path. After I got about 20, I entered the arena and fought the Ancient Guardian. This guy isn't a really tough boss, but for Weber, he's a complete joke. At this point, Weber's army is so strong that all it takes is one fake attack with the boomerang, and AG is as good as dead. My army melts him with a DPS of almost 300 damage per second, which is about the same as Mighty Wolfgang with a Dark Sword. The only possible concern is the Shadow Tentacles, because they might damage one of the spiders enough to possibly get them killed if AG does his AoE jump attack. However, this is easily solved by blowing the Webby Whistle to get the Horde away from the Tentacles, and then re-aggroing them onto AG. After a mere 45 seconds, AG dies and I blow the webby whistle to prevent my spiders from eating all the loot. 
Eiji's chest contained a Magi and a Star Color Staff, but no Lazy Explorer. The only thing I really need from the runes is two Star Color Staffs, a Deconstruction Staff, and the Pick slash Axe. Armor and Weaponry don't really matter since Weber fights almost everything with spiders, so after upgrading a suit of Science Station and obtaining all the gear I needed, I dropped the rest of the gems and threw the site at the station and headed out of the caves. Now is probably the most annoying part of the run, because unfortunately for Weber, befriended spiders will not follow him when he enters and exits caves. Instead, they will stay in the shard, and even worse, if Weber is in another shard, they will teleport back into their dens if it's daytime. However, you can de-link them from their dens if you put them into your inventory. So I make three backpacks and fill them all with spiders, and spend the day dumping spiders on the surface by moving back and forth between shards. Once all the spiders are on the surface, and had all my gear, I was finally ready to take on the raid bosses. It's pretty much winter already, so after making a few crockpots, some banana shakes for Sandy, and a thermal stone, I headed over to the Shadow Pieces fight. The usual order that the pieces are fought in is Knight, Bishop, and Rook. However, I'm using spiders for the fight, which means I want to save the Knight for last, considering he's the only piece that does a single target attack. Once Knight falls, I ensure that my beeflo is well fed, and mine the Rook statue to start the fight. After sicking my army on the Rook, it dies in about 5 seconds, which in turn causes the two other pieces to level up. At this level, both pieces are considered bosses and gain the ability to panic spiders with their screeching. I do my best to dodge both and aggro my army onto the bishop. Although the bishop is going to be hammering away at the spiders with its AoE attack, they all have enough HP and are getting healed so much that they are able to just tank it. Once the bishop dies, the knight levels up to 3. This guy hits really hard and is undodgeable even with super speed. Because of this, I stay as far away from him as I can, and take attacks with the boomerang. This way he stays aggroed onto the spiders instead of Weber. The knight deals 150 damage per attack, but it's only hitting a single target, and all the spiders are getting healed for 150 HP every time there's jumps, so the army is almost invincible against him. The knight can neutralize all spiders with his scream, and when this happens, it's possible for him to retarget Weber if Weber is close enough, which is why it's important for me to stay away. Once he stops screaming, I just re-aggro all my spiders onto him from a distance with the boomerang. After draining the knight of its 8100 HP, I beat in my first raid boss without losing a single spider. The great thing about Weber is that once I have my army, I pretty much don't need to prep anything for the rest of the bosses I'll be fighting in the winter. So after dropping off the shadow pieces loot at base, I headed over to Dragonfly. On the way, I decided to hunt Mactus because I'll need a lazy explorer for when I eventually fight Fuweaver, like all the other non-boss mobs. One fake attack with the boomerang and these guys are dead seconds later. After getting the tusk and the tam, I summoned the Dwarf Star and started the Dragonfly fight. Out of all the raid bosses, Dragonfly is probably Weber's best matchup, as long as you know what you're doing. Before I aggro my spiders, I make sure both them and Dragonfly are on the outside of the walls. Then I start attacking her. At this point, my army is doing so much damage that Dragonfly gets knocked out, and by the time it wakes up, it is 3000 HP below the phase 2 threshold. This causes it to immediately go to spawn lava. Once it does this, I use the Webby Whistle to call my spiders back and just wait for Dragonfly to finish. Once she crosses back over the walls, I aggro the army onto her and just let them do their thing. Dragonfly is only dealing 150 damage to a single target, so she has no chance of killing any of them unless she enrages. To prevent that from happening, my entire attention is on her lava. Once I see only one lava is left, I blow the webby whistle to stop my spiders from attacking Dragonfly and put everything to sleep with the pan flute. Then I wake my spiders up with a webby whistle and wait for the last lava to die. Once this happens, it's safe to start attacking Dragonfly again. And that's the Dragonfly fight in a nutshell. Weber doesn't need to do any fighting, just watch the lava and use the whistle and pan flute to re-aggro the horde until Dragonfly is dead.
With a crazy DPS of my army, I'm able to beat Dragonfly in well under 4 minutes. After the fight, I picked up all the loot, dropped it off at my base, and started searching for the no-eyed deer. I ended up finding them in the mosaic biome. With the deer antlers, I have everything I need for the claws fight. On day 25, I socketed the antler into the loot stash to summon claws. Weber is in my opinion the best character for fighting claws in phase 1. Both fire and ice spells shut down the spiders, but the deer will only target the horde if they are aggroed onto claws when the deer begins their cast. So all I do is blow the webby whistle before that happens, and then once the deer begin the cast on me, I re-aggro the horde back onto claws with the boomerang. Fighting claws like this makes phase 1 go by really quickly. I think this army is doing around 2500 damage in between spells. After phase 1 is over, Klaus goes down and gets revived with 5000 HP. He also gains a pounce attack and screams. Both of these will panic all the spiders. Klaus spams these moves so often that to my knowledge, there's no clean way to use the army against him in phase 2. So I just fight him solo. The spider variants have enough HP and are still getting healed here and there, so more than likely none of them will die, and they will help out a little, but it's ultimately just a regular Klaus fight. After Klaus dies a second time, I take all of his loot and drop it at base. The next boss of the list is the one that Weber is most famous for, B-Queen. I don't think Weber is the best character for B-Queen. Maxwell, Winona, or Wirt are probably deserving of that title. Weber is good at dealing with her, but unlike all the other bosses we fought, he will almost certainly lose a few spiders in this fight. So once I got to the hive, I hammered it to summon B-Queen. The first thing she does is panic all my spiders. So I wait until they all calm down, and then re-aggro them onto the queen while avoiding her grumbles. That's basically all I need to do for phase 1. B-Queen only does 120 damage to a single target, so she has absolutely no way of dealing with all my spider variants. Once her health goes down to 3 quarters, she enters phase 2, panics all my spiders and summons another set of grumbles. This phase is no different than phase 1. I just wait until my spiders calm down, re-aggro them onto her, and then watch as she gets melted. Once her health goes to half, then things get more tricky. In phases 3 and 4, she will scream at her grumbles which sends them flying at super speed. Every time she screams, all the spiders will get panicked. But that isn't what kills them. What kills them is that while they are panicked, about half the grumble bees will focus on a single spider which is enough to kill it. Because of this, I'm losing about one spider every time she screams. Once she stops screaming, I begin taking attacks on her until all my spiders are re-aggroed. I may be losing a spider every cycle, but my army is so strong that they deal about 2000 damage to her in between screams, so I still end up walking away with a really potent army. Of course, since this is DST, I again get a hound wave in the middle of a boss fight. This isn't a really big deal, it just costs me a cycle, which probably means a spider or two. Once her health drops to a quarter, she enters phase 4, which is pretty much exactly the same as phase 3, except she will scream more frequently. After a 3 and a half minute fight and around 10 casualties, B-Queen dies on day 27. With B-Queen dead, there's just one more raid boss that I'll be beating during winter, and that's the Twins. The Twins are a hard counter to Weber, each does 250 damage to mobs per charge, and in phase 2, they charge so rapidly that nurse healing becomes irrelevant. In other words, this fight is dangerous, and if I wasn't going out of my way to use spiders, I probably would just put them away at this point and fight the Twins solo. However, while dangerous, it is possible to beat the twins while keeping most of the spiders alive. So on the night of day 28, I activate the terrarium to summon the twins. As soon as they spawned in, I pan flute both of them to sleep. Then without even waking my army up, with the webby whistle, I attack the green one while positioning myself so that he charges away from Red Nazer. Eventually my horde catches up to spasmatism and joins the fight. 
even though I am leading him away, some of the Dangling Death Dwellers are still getting hit by the charges, which causes them to slowly die off. Once I see Spasmatism target my spiders, I quickly blow the pan flute to put everything to sleep. Then I wake up the horde with the webby whistle and start fighting again. Spasmatism is much more dangerous than Retinazer, since you'll barely have any time to react to his charges in phase 2. However, since he only has 3000 HP, I was basically beating him while keeping most of the horde intact. There was still a bunch of night left, so I started to fight Retinazer too. The strategy for him is exactly the same. Position yourself on the opposite side of the horde and lead his charges as far away from them as possible. Fortunately, he didn't switch targets, so I ended up draining him to 5000 HP without losing any more spiders. The next night, I fought Retinazer again, and finished him off with only a few more casualties. Since I did so well with the twins, I still had a pretty strong army. The next day I went around and started collecting spider dens so I could replant them near base. My army proved their potency by clearing out all the merms and tentacles surrounding a tier 3 den without the slightest difficulty. Since it's day 30, that means it's deer clops time. So once night falls, I make sure that I'm far away from the base and near at least one tree. Deer Clops isn't the raid boss, but he has a highly damaging AoE attack that also freezes. If you sick all the spiders onto Deer Clops without a plan, they'll be perpetually frozen in place until they are all killed. The way to beat Deer Clops with spiders is to first have the ideal army, and second, fight Deer Clops near a burning tree. The fire will instantly defrost the spiders, which allows the nurses to heal all of them up. Deer Clops does a ton of damage, but he attacks pretty slowly, about once every 4 seconds. The spider variants that I'm using can all tank at least 2 hits from him, and by the time Deer Clops goes for a third, the entire army is healed by the nurses. So yeah, Deer Clops is viable with spiders. On day 31, I planted the spider dens at base, and then headed over to the Moonstone event. This event is again easy as Weber, since the army is invincible against hordes of single target enemies. Not only that, but I used my horde to basically plug up the only entrance that leads to the Moonstone, so the pigs and hounds will have to push their way through my army before they can get to it. After a bunch of dead pigs and hounds, I am rewarded with the Mooncaller staff. Now that all the surface mainland raid bosses are dead, I started to prepare for both the cave bosses and pearls quests. For Tolstol, I killed a bunch of Voltcoats for their horns, because I'll need the weather pains if I want to beat him with spiders. At this point, I wouldn't be killing anything for a while, so I parked all my spiders at the decorated den. I then went into the caves, found the spawner, and placed a single rock lobster near the arena. Before heading back to the surface, I caught a bunch of spitters, so I could add them to my army. I then chopped a bunch of trees, shaved some beefalo for wool, did a bunch of farming, and then headed to Lunar Island. Unfortunately, this map didn't make the location of the islands really obvious, so I set sail off the wrong coast. However, while boating towards the islands, I stumbled across a bunch of salt formations, which means the most frustrating RNG part of the run was over. After getting the 10 cookie cutter shells, I continued paddling to Lunar Island, and once there I assembled the Celestial Altar, made two glass cutters, and befriended a bunch of Shattered Spiders before sailing back. The Shattered Spiders have good offenses, however they don't quite measure up to the Spitters because they only have 225 HP, which makes them far easier to kill since bosses typically do 150 damage per attack. However, later in this run they'll really come in handy, which is why I'm bringing some of them back to base. Once back at base, I shoebox them next to the decorated den in order to add them to my army. At this point I was almost ready to do all of Pearl's chores. I just needed to get some light bulbs and the telelocator staff. So after making a staff and a quick trip to the caves, I launched the grass raft off the coast and paddled towards Pearl. Luckily for me, one of the waterlogged biomes spawned between Pearl and the mainland, which meant I now had access to sea striders. 
After getting to Pearl's Island, I started to complete all the chores. First, I built a chair for her, which I thought was supposed to come as a friendship point, but for some reason it didn't seem to work for me. The next three friendship points came from upgrading her house, all the way to level 3. For friendship points 5 and 6, I planted 10 flowers and killed a lure plant that spawns during spring. I got friendship point 7 from putting 6 kelp on her drying racks. I then got point 8 from planting and fertilizing 8 berry bushes. Then the next day, I gave Pearl my umbrella while it was raining and picked up all the trash in the water around her island. However, after doing that, she didn't cough up the pearl. This is why I assumed that the cherry task didn't count, so I just decided to come back later and give her flower salad for the final point. With Pearl's chores pretty much done, I headed back to base and decided it was time to kill a bunch of Moose for their down feathers. In other words, it was time to once again mobilize the army. After refriending most of the spiders, I headed out to hunt some giant geese. The Moose are by far the easiest of the seasonal giants for Weber. They only attack a single target and they have no way to panic the spiders. In other words, they fall into the same category as all the other fodder mobs that the army just steamrolls. So once I fake an attack on them with a the boomerang, they are as good as dead. The Mossings are a little more dangerous since they can split the army up and they might be able to take out a spider or two if it's a 1 versus 1 fight, but really they're hardly a threat and if I'm really concerned, simply blowing the webby whistle and focusing the entire army on them one by one solves that problem. After killing two sets of muscoos, I had enough down feathers to make three weather panes and a luxury fan. At this point it was almost summer and I wanted to at least finish getting the celestial sanctum pieces before hiding in the caves, so I once again parked all my spiders back at the parking lot. Then I deconstructed the collar staff for the iridescent gem, obtained the correct distilled knowledge, and unlocked it at the archives, and then spent a couple of days locating both sanctum pieces and bringing them to the Lunar Island raft. Once that was done, I spent the last few days of summer getting striders from the waterlog biome and killing the Lord of the Fruit Flies with a really minimalist army. On day 56, summer was finally here. I don't usually kill antlion because I view it as more of a chore than an accomplishment. However, I didn't want it interfering with the stuff I'd be doing in the caves, and I was also curious to see how my spiders would fare against it. So I mobilized the army once again, gave Antlion the cold thermal stone, and sick them onto her. The fight was pretty messed up. At first the army was doing great, however I think the shattered spiders ended up hitting some of the vote goats with their spike attacks, which shifted the focus of the army to the goats. I would have noticed this if I had kept my eye on the Antlion's HP bar, because at one point it basically stopped going down. So it took me a while to realize that my spiders weren't attacking the boss, and instead were either attacking the goats or the sand spikes. When I finally realized what was going on, I blew the webby whistle and re aggroed the army onto Antlion, which brought her to zero really quickly. Unfortunately, a bunch of my spiders did die, but I think they were mostly the weaker variants. With Antline out of the way, I picked a bunch of cactus flowers and bundled it at base. Then I headed to the caves. I only have two goals while I'm down there, and that is to beat Toadstool and Fueweaver. The Toadstool fight is way more risky than Fueweaver, so I will be fighting Toad last. Of course, since this is a Weber run, I'm going to be fighting Fueweaver with spiders. Amazlari came up with a method for beating Fueweaver with the help of Shattered Spiders. It's pretty cool and if you want to see it, you should check out his video. However, I'm using a brand new strategy that I came up with. Instead of Shattered Spiders, I'll be using Spitters. So before heading to the ruins, I head once again to the Spilagmite Biome and befriend as much Spitters as I can. After I got at least 20, I turned some of the Cave Spiders into Nurses and then headed to the Wilds. With my new army, I slaughtered legions of Shadow Spa Monkeys for the Cave Bananas and then converted all of that into a bunch of Banana Shakes for Samni. Then after crafting a bunch of crowns for armor, I cheated into the void and headed to the atrium. Once at the atrium, instead of immediately teleporting in, I parked my beefalo in a small corner pocket and then positioned all of my spiders so that they were in the midpoint of the side of the arena. Then I teleported in and dropped a single piece of pig skin onto the ground. The skin will keep the spiders from straying off to the other sides as I move around during the fight. After that, I built the correct skeleton, got my sandy up, organized my inventory, and when I was finally ready, I inserted the shadow atrium to start the fight. Since summoning Fueweaver decreases your sandy by 40, I immediately eat a banana shake because each of these restores a whopping 33 sanity. I then lure Fueweaver so that he's basically standing on the pigskin that I dropped and then I started swinging away. At this position, he's within most of the spider's range, so they are able to help me out with their bullets, while having the benefit of not being targeted by Fueweaver since they aren't even in the arena. Their rapid fire projectile attacks massively boosts Weber's DPS, which makes phase 1 go by extremely quickly. Once Fueweaver's HP drops below 10,000, he enters into phase 2. In this phase, he becomes invincible and summons woven shadows and recovers 400 HP for each one that he eats. 
all of these actions will cause all the spiders to panic. So my goal is to lead him around the arena while destroying the hidden hands in order to drop his shield. The hidden hand that is closest to my spiders is the one that I leave for last. I also have to keep myself in the middle of the arena else my spiders will wander off to the edge that I want them to stay on. So after doing a circle, I position Fuel Weaver by the pigskin, destroy the last hand, and start attacking him. As you can see, the spitters add so much to Weber's DPS that I dropped Fuel Weaver by over 5000 HP in one cycle. Unfortunately, Bad luck and a nightmare creature causes Fuel Weaver to lose track of me and walk straight into all his woven shadows, which in turn causes him to heal up a ton of HP. However, the amount of damage I'm dealing with each round still massively eclipses this. cycles and a lot of screw-ups, Fuel Weaver dies on day 66. I haven't beaten the Nightmare Werepig, so unfortunately, we don't get to see the Charlie cutscene this time. After picking up the loot, I hop on my B-Float to get back to the Void and head to the Ruins. Before I leave the Ruins, I want to befriend a ton of Dangling Death Dwellers for the Nightmare Werepig and Toadstool, so I make a quick trip back to the Labyrinth and befriend about 20 of them. Since the Ruins regenerated, I decided to beat AG again, just for the meat that he drops. After that, I headed to the Nightmare Werepig, freed him by vibrating the pillars, killed the Shadelings and started the fight. This guy is just as easy as the Ancient Guardian. Although all his attacks are AoE, they're not only too weak, but he also attacks too slowly to outdamage the Spider Nurse's healings. I already beat Fuel Weaver and Weber doesn't really need the Dreadstone armor, so I don't really care about smashing the pillars. After a really short fight, the pig dies and I use the blueprints that he drops to restore my sanity. There's only two more days of summer and I still need to beat Toadstool, but fortunately, spiders allow Weber to kill Toad really quickly. The Weber Toadstool strategy is something I came up with a while back, and although it's pretty risky, at the end of the day, I think it's really cool if you can successfully pull it off. The strategy revolves around putting your spiders away while Weber deals with the spore caps, and calling them back once Toadstool is completely depowered. The Rock Lobster allows me to put the spiders away, since once I initiate an attack on the lobster, the spiders will never stop attacking it until I blow the webby whistle. So once I'm ready, I chop the mushroom to summon Toadstool. After he spawns in, I call my spiders with the webby whistle, and then start to fight Toadstool. In phase 1 and 2, Toadstool has two moves, Spore Caps and Boom Shrooms. The Boom Shroom deals 100 damage each, and he throws at least 4 at a time. However, he does it so slowly that the spider nurse healing lets the army just tank all the damage. Spore Bombs are an issue, because spiders will not avoid them and they'll stun lock the nurses, so it's important to make sure these detonate far away from the arena. The army is doing so much damage that by the time Toadstool starts to spawn spore caps, he's almost in phase 2. Summoning spore caps causes all the spiders to panic. At this time, I put everything to sleep with the pan flute, wake my spiders up with the webby whistle, and bring them all the way back to the rock lobster and aggro them onto it. Now that the spiders are put away, I fight Toadstool solo until he finishes spawning. Once he's got all 8 spore caps up, I lure him to the outside of the arena, away from the ponds, and freeze him with the ice staffs. Only after he is frozen do I use the weather paints to destroy the spore caps. Once they're all destroyed, I call my spiders with the whistle and start fighting Toadstool again. 
From here on, it's the same as Phase 1. Let the army melt Toastal because they are pretty much unkillable, and drop spore bombs as far away as possible. After 45 seconds, Postal will begin to walk back to the center to spawn spore caps. He does this for 15 seconds and during this time, he will just ignore everything so it's an opportunity to do free damage. This was the reason why I lured Toadstool to the outside of the arena. Once he begins to summon spore caps, it's just a repeat of the previous cycle. Soon after all the spore caps are destroyed, Tosto enters phase 3. In this phase, he does a double stop attack which will devastate the army. Because of this, it's not safe to simply let the spiders attack him forever. Instead, I let them attack Tosto and then call them away from Toad a few seconds before he goes to double stop. As Tosto's health gets lower and lower, the interval in which he double stomps becomes shorter and shorter, so I end up fighting him solo and use my spiders only when he starts to walk back to the center. My army is dealing so much damage, Toadstool drops dead in less than a day. It's now day 70 so summer is basically over and I'm ready to head back to the surface. Because the Toadstool fight went so well, I still have a really potent army, just like I did the first time I went to the caves. I brought all these guys to the surface and combined them with my surface army at the decorated den. With the cave raid bosses out of the way, the only two remaining are Crab King and Celestial Champion. Before I could get to Crab King, I had to complete Pearl's chores. So I turned the cactus flowers I had stored earlier into flower salad and delivered it to Pearl in exchange for her Pearl. After that, I stopped at the waterlog biome and befriended all the striders I could get. And once at base, I brought out all the ones I had gotten earlier because these are the guys I'll be using to fight Crab King. Using the Astro Detectors, I located Crab King, cleared out a bunch of rocks on one side, and socketed the Pearl and 8 Purple Gems to start the fight. Unfortunately, I forgot to bring my Boomerang. I thought I didn't need it because once I initiated an attack on CK, the striders would never stop attacking him. However, I was wrong because a bunch followed me away from him and another bunch got sidetracked by the whale that started attacking them. The few that were trying to kill Crab King were simply not doing enough damage. So I had to do a pretty dangerous move, which is paddle to Crab King and land an attack on him without drowning. It basically cost me two boats to do it, but in the end, I was able to destroy one of his claws and re-aggro all the striders onto him before getting away on a raft again. Once the Shredders were all attacking him, the fight was a walk in the park. All I had to do was paddle back and forth as he tried to sink my ship with geysers. I had at least 20 Striders, so he's taking a lot of damage and is barely able to heal through the rapid attacks. Once Crab King is defeated, 
I used the Pinch and Winch to retrieve the Celestial Tribute, brought it all the way to Lunar Island, and then socketed it to activate the Moonstorms. Before heading back to the mainland, I befriended a bunch of Shattered Spiders, because they are extremely good for helping Wagstaff and his experiments. When Wagstaff is in the process of making the Restrained Static, waves of birds will spawn and try to kill you, and destroy the experiment. Usually it's quite annoying to deal with these guys, because you'll have to run around and hit all of them individually, while trying not to get hit yourself. With Shattered Spiders and Spider Nurses, dealing with them is really easy. Unless an enemy is right next to it, the Shattered Spider will opt to use its ranged spike attack. These both inflict damage when they appear and when they disappear, and a single spider can create up to 7 of them with one attack. When you have 10 or more Shattered Spiders attacking a single target, they produce so many spikes that it's basically a giant AoE attack. So for Weber, dealing with a flock of angry birds is as simple as faking an attack with the boomerang. Once I helped out Wagstaff three times, I got back to Lunar Island and summoned the Celestial Champion. Unfortunately, this is the one boss fight where in my opinion, spiders are just completely unviable. All of Celestial Champion's attacks are very frequent, AoE, and deal massive damage. There's no way that nurses are going to outheal any of that. I know I could just summon a bunch of spider queens by haunting tier 3 dens, but not only is that method barely even useful, but it also requires you to use spiders that are not under your control. Half the fun of using Weber spiders is knowing that you are in control of them, so if you succeed, it's because you control them well, and if you fail, you control them poorly. So it's a method that I really don't have an interest in using. With that said, I'm fighting Celestial Champion pretty much as Wilson. Stat-wise, Weber is identical to Wilson except he has higher health and hunger, but lower sanity. I'm using the Bone Helm, so sanity is just a non-issue for me. I'm also using Bone Armor, since it really helps preserve the durability of the helm, unless I mess up. I'm using Dark Swords and a Hambat as my weapon, instead of a B-Flow, since both greatly outdamage it. Like Phase 1, Phase 2 for CC is fought exactly the same as the way Wilson would. Since I'm using animation cancelling, I'm able to get a few extra hits on CC before I need to dodge. In this phase, CC has two attacks that only hit once. Since I'm using the bone armor, I can straight up ignore these attacks, which also increases my overall DPS. Phase 3 is the worst phase because this guy moves around a bunch, and often moves right on top of one of its spires, which makes it annoying to hit. I just fight him as Wilson while leaning on the bone armor to let me play more aggressive.
after over a day of fighting, Celestial Champion finally goes down on day 84. With that, I've beaten all the raid bosses, and with the exception of CC, I did it with using the unique abilities of Weber. It's a bummer that there isn't really a viable strat for taking down CC with spiders, especially since he's the last boss. Therefore, in order to end this run on a positive note, I paddled back to the mainland, mobilized my entire army that has basically doubled in size since the first time I left the caves, fought Dragonfly and Bee Queen again. Dragonfly got melted so bad that the fight was over in less than 2.5 minutes, while Bee Queen died in less than 4. For the full fights, the link is in the description. If you made it to the end of this video, I'd like to say like always, thanks for watching, take care, and have a great day.